Would you give God a hand clap of praise? Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, I'm thanking you in advance for the ones that you're going to heal tonight, for the ones that you're going to bless tonight, for the ones that destiny are going to be changed because of the moment that we just stepped into. I praise you right now before the miracle, before the healing, before the breakthrough, because I know you're faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you praise him one more time? <laughs> Hallelujah. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is an honor to be with you all tonight at CT. I give honor to the apostles and the pastors of this house, Pastor Don and Pastor Susan, and uh, to every minister that's been here, every pastor that's spoken. Had I known that I was going to preach on the night after Wayne Francis, I probably would not have come to the conference. <laughs> Amen. But it is an honor to be with you tonight, and I'm thankful for the opportunity. Uh, there are, I have a book table somewhere out there, and there's two books that I've written. One is called The Triumphant Church, and I wrote it uh, based on some things that happened to me when I was a church planner. One day, everybody loved me, and then one day, nobody loved me anymore. <laughs> no one in this house has ever had that experience, but no, none of you have ever gotten sarcastic with your ministry, but uh, I'm from Chicago, and we, we, we don't speak in tongues, we speak in sarcasm. And uh, one day I told my wife, I'm like, you know what, we just ought to change the name of this church Instead of the Pentecostals in Norfolk, it ought to be the Pentecostal car wash because we come in, clean them up, and they go right back out. <laughs> and so I did what every good Pentecostal does. We can't go to the bar because, you know, we don't drink. So I went to camp meeting. That's where we go. And this, uh, this bishop was preaching. You might know him. His name is Bishop Tenney. Bishop T.F. Tenney was preaching, and he said, there is a preacher in this house. And you're struggling in your church and you need to rise up and say, oh, God, give me a book of Acts church. So that's exactly what I did. I said, oh, God, give me a book of Acts church. And God spoke. He said, have you read the book of Acts? I said, Jesus, I'm Pentecostal. It's the only one I read in the Bible. I backslid one time, played the lottery. I played 238. I thought that was your number, Jesus. I mean, this is all I've ever known. It's a little joke. Some will get it, some won't. That's all right. Pick four. Play 28, 19 as well, Jesus. I mean, I did the pick three. And the, anyhow. But God took me through a journey that I needed to see of the stuff in the book of Acts. The issues. Leadership issues. Corruption issues. Issues of racism and segregation and corruption. And everything that we think that we're the first generation to ever fight, turns out they've been fighting it since the book of Acts. So when you said, give me a book of Acts church, he gave it to you in the middle of a pandemic. But the book of Acts church did not let corruption, racism, leadership issues, irrelevance, stop them from having signs, miracles, wonders, and Holy Ghost revival. And if that was true for the first century... You don't even need the book anymore. I just told you about it. If it's true for the first century, then it's true for the 21st century. So that book's out there. It's called The Triumphant Church. And then there's a book that I just released last week called Defeating the Spirit of Hyena. And it's a sermon and a word that the Lord gave me about three months ago about one of the spirits of the age that I believe we're fighting. I believe if you're going to win a fight, you have to know what you're fighting. And I think we're labeling everything Jezebel. And I think Jezebel sitting somewhere in hell saying, I wish I could do half the stuff the church thinks I could do. Poor old Jezze gets blamed for everything. And there's some other spirits that are hiding back there doing some work. And they're having success because they haven't been discovered yet. But we have exposed them and now we're pushing back. And so both of those are available. And when you buy those books, those books are for revival. Everything from that book table goes to tent revivals that we're hosting around the United States. And to the brother that gave the prophetic word about giving, before I enter into my sermon, 
I came to this pulpit with the first assignment. I was going to prophesy and give a word about finances before I preached this sermon. And so I want to do it through a very quick testimony. Last year, in the middle of a pandemic, I was sitting at home. Didn't have anywhere else to go. And I was doing Facebook Lives and talking to people. And my, I live in East Tennessee now. It's a witness protection program. And so I'm out in the mountains over there. It's just me and one other Colombian over there. You know, you know something happened if we're in the mountains. And so I was under a... <laughs> Oops, I guess we're going to have to move again. Um, we were at a fireworks tent that my wife's family runs, and I was sitting under a fireworks tent, and I felt the Holy Ghost speak to me. I felt the Lord say, you know, for as Pentecostal as you say you are, you've never set one of these up for me. I said, a firework tent? He said, no, a tent. <laughs> Pentecostal as you say you are, the remnant of Pentecost, you've never had a tent revival. And so we set out, we had a little tent revival last year in Nashville. We didn't know if anybody would come. We had 4,000 people come, 400 baptized in the Holy. I mean, God moved in a mighty, mighty way. And in February, I got a call from an evangelist named Ted Shuttlesworth. And Brother Shuttlesworth called me. He said, I want you to come to my camp meeting. I have a gift for you. And I got to the camp meeting, and he said, Tony, God spoke to me, and God told me to give you my tent. I can seat 1,500 people in the tent. He said, the tent is yours. You don't have to ask for it. You don't have to look for it. It's yours. And then a few weeks later, I was on a television program, and a lady wrote to the website and said, I was touched by what you said tonight. My husband just passed away. He used to be an evangelist, and I want to do something to honor his memory, and I'm donating a complete sound system to your ministry. So I got a tent, and a few weeks later, I got the sound system. And then Mike Ramirez that just painted that picture, he was at the tent revival in Nashville, Nashville a few weeks ago. Brother Shuttlesworth called a few months later, and he said, Brother Tony, the Lord spoke again. And he said, you gave him a tent, but there's nowhere for anybody to sit. And so he gave us 800 chairs. I didn't ask for it. I didn't look for it. I just got it. And then a few weeks later, someone called and said, you need lights. I never asked for them. I never looked for them. I just got them. This year, I've gotten a tent. I've gotten chairs. I've gotten sound system. I've gotten lights. Not one time did I pray for it. Not one time did I look for it. I even ha I haven't had to negotiate for it. I haven't had to bargain, basement, hunt, whatever it is that you do at Home Goods. I didn't have to do anything for it. It just came to me. And here's the word of the Lord to you. This is a season where you don't even have to ask for it. You don't even have to pray for it. It's coming to you. The Father says, I have commanded my blessing to come upon my chosen select that have chosen revival over riots. They've chosen to have church over chaos. And because I know that they're faithful to the call, I have commanded my blessing to come upon them. I have loosed my angels in heaven and I have told my angels, fetch their buildings, fetch their airplanes, fetch their cars, fetch their money, fetch their debt cancellation. And oh, by the way, fetch your revival and your harvest and I declare to you it's coming without you even having to lift a finger for the Lord says I lift my hand in your favor give them praise in this house oh I feel the Holy Ghost I feel him here right now I know you can't touch your neighbor because you're still nervous about that, but look at your neighbor and say he's prophetic, not political. But if, because I think everything happening is a spiritual attack. I think there's enough discernment in this room that we can see beyond what's going on and realize it's not political. It has nothing to do with elephants and donkeys. It has everything to do with a serpent named Lucifer. But he forgot that there is a lion, there is a lamb, and there is a dove that has risen up against him. And God promised me that in the same manner when Pharaoh's serpents appeared before Moses, Moses' serpent ate Pharaoh's serpents. He said, you let the body of Christ know. I know the serpent has slithered and he's exposed himself in front of them, but you let them know the lion of the tribe of Judah is about to show up and one roar. One roar from my mouth is going to cause revival. Everything, it, it's, it, man, I have a sermon to preach. I got a sermon to preach, but I got stirred up since I got up here.
And they try to stop us from getting on airplanes. That's as far as I'll go with it. Because they're trying. We won't let them stop us from preaching the gospel. If they say we can't get on their airplanes, we'll buy our own airplanes. If they, can't, if they say we can't go in their buildings, God will give us buildings we didn't build. He'll give us vineyards. We, we're not going to let the systems of this world stop the kingdom because it's already been established. Of his government, there shall be no end. So I speak revival over you. I speak prosperity over you. I speak abundance over you. Evangelists, I speak Holy Ghost revival over you. May your calendar fill up. If you don't have a church, get a tent. If you don't have a tent, get Facebook. But preach the gospel and watch God bless you. All right, I got a sermon to preach. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost is here in a strong way. And I'm trying to behave. I'm reading, of course, any translation will do. For what I want to use tonight, I'm going to read from Matthew 1, 1 from the N-E-T. I don't know what the N-E-T is, but I'm reading from the net tonight. This is the record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And I want to preach to you tonight from this sermon that I want to entitle, The Begotten blessing. I have given my life to be a remnant of Pentecost, to preach Holy Ghost revival till Jesus comes where I see the tomb, to preach signs, miracles, and wonders, and to make sure Pentecost stays alive in my generation for my children and my children's children. And I got a lot to say about that, but I have been very convicted since this morning about preaching to you about your family. I feel the Holy Ghost on me so strong. I've been waiting to come here and share this word with you. It might be a little bit of a different type of a sermon than what I normally preach. But I believe that before it's all said and done, there is going to be a flood of healing that's hits, that hits this house. And a renewing in your spirit. Because God's in this place. Father, use me for your glory tonight. Touch our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to discern. What thus saith the word of the Lord. And I ask that you confirm it tonight with signs, miracles, and wonders in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 You be seated in the presence of the Lord. My pastor, my apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, and teacher, who had his birthday yesterday, Sam Rodriguez, told me you cannot go to that house in Houston and not greet them on my behalf. So I greet you on behalf of Pastor Sam Rodriguez in Jesus' name. <laughs> amen. I have a uh, love and hate relationship, if I can say it that way, with the city of Houston. I love you for your fajitas. <laughs> I love you for your Whataburger. <laughs> Tabash. Oh, oh, where's my catcher? I love you for your chips and salsa. I can sit down in one day and go to Papacitos and go to Lupe's and go to Nifas and appreciate them all. I don't even have to compare them. I just love them all with the love of Jesus. I just love them all. I love this city. But some of my worst memories are in this city. It was five years ago this week precisely that I buried my first wife who passed away in this city. My wife was diagnosed with leukemia. February of 2016, we were pastors. We had three young children at home. The oldest was 10. Our daughter was 8. Our youngest was 5. Well, 10, 7, and 5 when the diagnosis came. 
I had just gotten done preaching a healing crusade in Southern California. God was moving. God had blessed. God had done great things. And I got a call, a frantic call from my son, 10 years old. Daddy, mommy can't walk. Something's wrong with mommy. Mommy fell out of the bed. Daddy, I don't know what to do. Daddy, I don't know what to do. And I had to walk my son through calling 911. And he called the ambulance. And they came and they got my wife. And I got on an airplane. And I flew home from the West Coast to the East Coast. We were living in Virginia Beach at the time. And I got home, I got to a hospital, and I walked into a death sentence. Sir, it's leukemia. It's a rare form of leukemia. It's an aggressive form of leukemia. And we project she probably has about two weeks to live. No symptoms, nothing wrong before. She had been at, 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 at a church function or something with some friends the night before. And all of a sudden, our world spins out of control. And I get to the hospital, and I'd love to tell you that I prayed the prayer of faith. I'd love to tell you that I pointed my finger at her and said, by the authority of the word of God. Ah, by the power that's in the name of I wish I could tell you that I did that. But I lifted my eyes to heaven, and I said, where are you? Because I don't see you here. I saw you in California. I saw you in that service, but I don't see you here. And Pastor Sam called me. It was about, at that point, I don't know, midnight, one in the morning. And Pastor Sam called me, and I answered the phone, and he said, you be careful what comes out of your mouth. You be careful what you say in this moment. Not, how's she doing? How are you doing? It was a straight rebuke. You be careful what comes out of your mouth. For you have inquired of the Lord, and you have asked, where is God? He said, and let me ask you, Suarez. Where was God when the three Hebrew children were in the fiery furnace? And I, in, through crying and tears, I said, in the fire? I said, and he said, show me in the scripture where it says that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saw him in the fire. He said, it's not there. They never saw him. Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth man in the fire. He said, and just because you don't see God, that does not negate the fact that God is with you, that God is for you, and God is blessing you. I feel like I got to pause and talk to a pastor that's in this room. It says, I haven't seen God since 1999. I haven't seen God in five years. I haven't seen revival. I haven't seen the Holy Ghost. Just because you haven't seen it does not negate the fact that God has been fighting off devils for you. God's been making a way for you. You don't know what the word has been doing for you when you didn't think it was working. He said, he's with you. And we went on a six-month journey of highs and lows and a lot of faith and a lot of belief. Words that leukemia was going to bow its knees at the name of Jesus. And then five years ago this week, she passed away in this city at MD Anderson. And I become a single father of three kids. And I'm trying to understand what just happened with my life. Have you ever been in a place where you're trying to do the work of God? You're trying to do the work of heaven and hell raises up. But there was something about that year of what most people would look at as hell that was actually healing for our family. Because before we ever walked through cancer, before we ever walked through those situations, we had to walk through the valley. God, I'm going to be transparent tonight. We had to walk through the valley of an absent father and an absent husband. Because I was busy in the vineyard of the Lord, having revival, not knowing what was happening in my home. I was busy having church. I was busy having revival. I was busy building a church. And we were baptizing people, and people were getting saved, and people were saying yes to Jesus, and people were getting the Holy Ghost, and we bought property, and we hired some people, and we were a predominantly Hispanic church, and I challenged our people, the God that blesses the white church and blesses the black church can bless the mocha church. I mean, if he does it for them and he does it for them, he can do it for us. And I'm just, I'm challenging our people, and we're believing in God's blessing, and God's doing great things with us. 
and and I, I I was the kind and this you know this is I felt when I saw when I saw the apostle today I, I felt a little bad I didn't even wear socks to church today oh my God it's like you know please pray for our ministry we can't even afford socks I mean I just felt bad I saw him in a suit and tie and socks I'm like Lord help me lead I gotta remember to pack emergency socks for moments like this. But that was back in those days when we were always wearing suits and ties. And I kept all my suits and all my ties. I kept everything in the church office. I was an office rat. I was always in the office. I'd get there at 7 a.m. Usually didn't come home till after 7 p.m. Because there was no price too great for a revival. No problem I couldn't solve. And I lived there, had my clothes there. And we bought the property. And I asked these guys in the church. They were good guys. They were awesome. They were faithful. I said, look, there's a bathroom here. Can you build a shower here so that when I, and they never would build the shower. Months have gone by. It's awkward. And I don't really like, you know, like I'm not very confrontational. But finally I was like, you know, guys, like, you know, like what's up? I mean, like where's the shower? And they awkwardly I'm like, well, Pastor, uh, it's your wife. I'm like, my wife? Your wife said we can't build you the shower because if we build you the shower, you'll never go home. And our church is growing, and we're having revival, and everything's great. I'd walk into church, and I'd say, boo, and they're like, everything's great. And then one day it wasn't. And everybody's leaving, and I'm getting frustrated, and I'm mad, and I'm coming home from preaching, and I'm taking my jacket off, and I'm throw I mean I know you guys don't do this but this is the Colombian in me I'm just throwing it in the closet and I'm just frustrated because every every week instead of getting a soul saved another person say goodbye and there was this one midweek service I came home frustrated because someone that I thought was faithful said I'm out deuces see you later and I came home frustrated and I threw everything in the closet and the dog looked at me like I went to check on each of my kids in the room, and I could, I could see in the darkness an eye just kind of piercing out from under the blanket, but just closing quickly because they knew Daddy's in a bad mood. And I walk in the room, and my wife sits up, and she said, you better wake up. I said, girl, I is awake. She said, you better wake up. She said, you're, focus, you're so focused on everybody that left you that you don't know how to value and appreciate the people that are still with you. You don't know how to love the people that love you because you're so obsessed with the people that you think don't love you. She said, there's still people there that need a pastor. She said, oh, by the way, there's a wife that needs a husband, and there's some kids that need a father, but you're so consumed with the stuff that you're living in, you're losing the things that love you. God started dealing with my heart. He gave me a dream one night. I'll have a lot of dreams. I had a dream, and I saw Calvary, and I saw the cross, and I was just kind of hovering over the city in the dream, and I could see. It's like just watching the movie, and I felt the Lord ask me. He said, what do you see around the cross? I said, I see the soldiers, and he zoomed me into the foot of the cross. He said, what do you see there? And I said, I see your mom, your brother, and your aunt, he said, precisely. He said, I fed the multitude. I healed many. But in my moment of pain and anguish, the only people that stood by my feet was my family. And God started rebuking me. He started rebuking me. He said, he said, I've anointed you to preach the gospel. But the only thing that really matters is your family, Tony. At the end of the day, when death comes, and I didn't know how close death was, but when death comes, the only people that will be in that room is going to be your family. You better love your family. You better appreciate your family. You better fight for your family because it's all you really have at the end. And so I started a process of repenting. And I was, this, this is my prayer life for about three weeks. I started repenting and I said, oh God, 
Forgive me for sacrificing my family on an altar called revival. Forgive me for not being home for dinner because of an altar called revival. Forgive me for not being a good husband because of something called revival. Forgive me for not being a father that I needed to be to my kids because of an altar called revival. And after about a few weeks of praying this way, God rebuked me again and he said, stop. He said, it's not an altar of revival. It was the altar of ambition cloaked in revival. He said, I never told you to hire all those people. You did it. I didn't tell you to buy another building. You did it. I didn't tell you to start another program. You did it. And he rebuked me. He was really nice in his rebuke to me. He said, you have good intentions and you do it all in my name, but you're doing things in my name that I never told you to do. You're as ambitious as the CEO of a corporation. And he said, it takes faith to move mountains, but you can be as ambitious as, he said, but you're losing your family because because of an altar called ambition that you cloak in revival. You make it overly spiritual, but at the end of the day, you're just very ambitious. The God that I serve is a blesser. He is good. He is just. He is faithful. But ladies and gentlemen, he is a God of order. His blessings always come with instructions. Go wash in the pool. If my people humble themselves and pray. Sometimes he tells people to march. Sometimes he tells people to pray. Sometimes he tells them to shout. Sometimes he tells them to wait. And in the kingdom of heaven, the order to blessing is that it starts with your family. You can't change a nation if you don't first change your house. It started with Abraham. It started with, a, it started with an individual, and then a marriage, and then a family, and then a family group, and then that turns into tribes, and, it turn, and then it turns into a nation. But God's order of dealing with things isn't a nation to an individual. It's an individual to a nation. And yes, we are in a moment in, we are in, a moment in history where the nation needs revival. The nation needs repentance. The nation needs a move of God, but it starts in our home. We need, there are individuals starting with the man preaching to you. And there, I need an individual revival. I need an individual altar of repentance. And when I get myself right, then I can work on my marriage. And then I can work on my children. And then I can work on my family. And then I can work on my aunts and my uncles and my cousins. And then I can work on the community. And then maybe I can change the nation. But I can't focus so much on them and forget about me. God cares about your family, ladies and gentlemen. I'm telling you, I, I feel I don't, I shouldn't have to give the disclaimer, but I'm going to do it anyways. I am sold out to revival. There is no price too great. There is nothing I won't give for Holy Ghost revival except my family. Because he never said you had to sacrifice your family for revival. He is a blesser. He is good. But I heard someone say earlier today that there are blessings available to the next generation. He is the God of generation to generation. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God... That, that cares so much about family that when he began writing the New Testament through his authors, he started with a whole chapter of who begat who. Now, my dad was Pentecostal. How Pentecostal was he? He was so Pentecostal that we had poster boards up in the lobby with the names of every member in the church. Because in our church, you had to read the Bible all the way through or you could not be, you couldn't work in the nursery, you couldn't be an usher, you couldn't be in the sound system, let alone the platform. So every month you had to turn in a report of how many books you had read and they go, they go on the poster board and they put little stickers next to the books of the Bible. And it would be amazing how like October, November, nobody had read anything. And then in December, supernaturally, everybody read about 64 books of the Bible. So I have read this book. I love this book. 
But I remember reading Matthew chapter 1 and thinking, goodness, the author must have been on some kind of like a word count with the publisher and he just needed to fill a few pages. Because Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas, and Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Phares and Zara and Thamar, and Phares begat Esram, and Esram begat Aram, and Aram begat Abinadab, and Abinadab begat Nessa. This is how people first started speaking in tongues. They read Matthew chapter 1. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rach, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed of Ruth, and Obed of Jesse, and Jesse begat David, and David the king, and Solomon, and the wife, and Solomon, and Robot. I, I, I don't even know how to say half the names. And when I was a kid and I'd read those chapters, they were trivial chapters to me. They were, they were just, this is me fulfilling an obligation so I can still play the piano and not get benched next Sunday. Begat and begat and the father and Hezekiah and Josiah and these are the 14 generations and then here comes a little more. Nobody, when you ask people, what's your favorite Bible verse? Say John 3, John 3, 16, Acts 1 and 8 and. Uh, Second Chronicles 2020, nobody says Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. <laughs> when's the last time, when's the last time they turned that organ into E flat and someone said, and Salmon I begat Boaz and Boaz begat Rachel and Rachel, yeah, 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 and Rachel begat D. When's the last time you heard Bishop T.D. Jake say, slap somebody and say, Isaac's about to be got to Jacob. <laughs> but then I had children. And trivial verses became relevatory verses to me. Because I started seeing that these verses are proof positive that God blesses generations. He blesses family lines. And God's blessing is so big for you that you won't have room enough to contain it. The blessing that God puts on you is for your children and your children and your children's children and your children's 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 that's why you can't quit that pastorate. That's why you can't close that ministry. That's why you can't give up on the faith because you're not just doing it for you. You're doing it for your children and for your children's children because I prophesy a multi-generational blessing is on your family line because God chose you. And since he's not, here's the other thing that encourages me about Matthew chapter 1. Because he's not a respecter of persons, the same can be said about your family line. Because for every Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Matthew chapter 1, there's a whole mess of people in there that I don't even know who they are, where they came from, and what they did. They're a bunch of nameless people. But the name above every other name came from a lineage of nameless people. So don't you curse the work of your hands because you don't know what history making revival maker might be in your bloodline. It might be that nobody knows your name but there's a prophet, there's an apostle, there's a pastor in your bloodline and God's going to use them for his glory give them praise in this house Sometimes I read Matthew, now, now my kids have grown up and I've remarried and now I got five kids in the house and four-fifths of the kids are teenagers and I, oh my God, just pray for me a lot. And sometimes I go back and I got to read Matthew 1 to myself because Matthew 1 is proof positive that your children are blessed, your grandchildren are blessed, and the work that you're doing for God is not in vain because you read Matthew 1 and you see that the generations were blessed, that their children weren't poor, that their children served the Lord, that their children did great exploits for the Lord. And so I go home and I read Matthew 1 and I say, God, 
I thank you that you're not a respecter of persons. And if you could do it with the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, if a Jesus could come out of the lineage of Jesse and David, then I know something good can come out of the Suarez family, something good can come out of the McCool family. And so I declare over my children, I declare over my grandchildren, my generations are going to be blessed. My children are never going to be poor. My children are going to serve the Lord. My children are going to preach the gospel. My children are going to clothe the naked. My children children are going to feed the hungry. My family shall serve the Lord. I'm speaking blessings over my family. I'm, I'm building my family. I'm protecting my family. I'm, 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 I'm positioning them for the blessing of the Lord because I want, I, I, don't even, I don't even care if it's wrong to want it. I want my grandchildren to walk and walk under such a supernatural favor of God. I want my grandchildren to be so blessed that someone says, how did you get so blessed? And my grand my great grandchild says well you'd have to go down a few generations in the book and I had a great granddaddy named Tony I had a great great grandfather named Rito I had a great 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 grandfather named Ali and they gave their life to preaching the gospel and rebuking devils and laying hands on the and I'm blessed today because I got an Abraham an Isaac and a Jacob Why don't you start prophesying over your family right now? Start declaring blessing over your children and over your, my house shall serve the Lord. Oh, Ooh, I just felt it come on me right now. Hey, Pentecostal church, how about we make this declaration? Our children will preach the same Holy Ghost we preach. They will not waver in the faith. They will not be given over to secularistic ideas. They will not waver into liberal Christianity. They will not leave the Pentecostal message. But they too will rebuke devils. They too will speak with tongues. We will raise a generation that serves the Lord. In our house we speak English, hablamos español, and we speak in Holy Ghost tongues. We're trilingual people. I speak in Spanish today because that was my daddy's language. And when I wanted to talk to my dad, my mom was a white girl from Chicago that was a missionary to Colombia. When I talk to my mom, I talk in English. Pero cuando yo quería hablar con mi papá, yo tenía que hablar en español. Porque era el idioma de mi padre. Y para yo poder comunicarme bien como con mi papá, tenía que hablar en su idioma. When I really wanted to talk to my father, I had to speak his language. Because I wanted to make sure he really understood what I was saying. But you know why I spoke my father's language? Because I heard it in my home. I heard my dad speak Spanish. I heard my mother speak Spanish. Pentecostal church, how will your children speak with tongues if they never hear you speak with tongues? How will they know the language of the Spirit if they don't ever hear you? Get down and say, I'm Pente Come here. I'm Pentecostal today because when I was backslided, my mom would get a hold of me in the altar and say, You know what I did when my wife passed away? I got my kids and I said, He lavoko, he shatayanamos. Why? Because I heard the language in my house. You want to have Holy Ghost revival? Let it start in your house. Let it start in your marriage. Let it start in your kids. It's got to start in your house. I got memories, and so do you. When you got sick in our house, I'm talking about when I was a kid. When you got sick in our house, the first thing we did was not call the doctor, and I got nothing against doctors. Let me put the disclaimer out there right now so I don't get labeled. 
if God heals you through the prayer of faith, the doctor, or the medicine, he gets credit for all three. Because if he uses medicine, he created the minerals that are in the medicine to get you healed. If he uses a doctor, he gave the doctor the wisdom to tell you what to do to get better. And if he heals you through the prayer of faith, we know it's a, but one way or another, God always gets the glory. There's my disclaimer. But when I was a kid, when you got sick, I got a hunch you too, brother, right there with the goatee looking at me, nodding your head, yes. When you got sick in my house growing up, the first thing you did, one of the parents would go to the kitchen and they go under the kitchen sink. And it's like part of being Pentecostal. Everybody had the same old nasty glass bottle of olive oil with the yellow top on the... And when you unscrew, because you only use it to pray for the sick, when you unscrew it, a little bit of rust would fall in the oil. I wonder if that would heal the C word. I don't know. I'm just saying a little bit of the rust would fall in the oil, and we come in a dab of doo except in my house. My dad would anoint you like you were the doorsteps, and the death angel was coming. He just put it, I mean, just slop it, and just, in the name of Jesus. And then we would go to the doctor. How will your children know the gift of healing and the working of miracles if they don't hear you pray in your house for the sick? Is there still oil in your house? Is there still a prayer of faith? I'm talking about your family. How will they serve the same God? How will they preach like you preach if you don't do in your house what your parents did in their house? I'm talking about saving a generation. Because the people, oh goodness, this isn't in my notes, but the ones that are messing with the church are the sons of Pentecost. They know better. They spoke in tongues. They learn prosperity at our conferences. And then someone got foolish with prosperity, and rather than clean up the well, they capped it off and said no more prosperity. That's nice. After you get the building, then you stop pre preaching it. You got your airplane, so that's enough. Had a praying grandmother that got you through the worst times of your life. And you got someone that got a little crazy in the church. And rather than deal with one person, you just capped it off and said, no more tongues in the church. Yeah, now that you got your breakthrough. They're losing their homes. You didn't, we, didn't, we didn't lose a nation overnight. We lost our homes. We lost personal consecration. We, 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 we lost personal devotion. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not rebuking you. I'm preaching to myself tonight. I'm just letting you listen. Because when I grew up, we would gather around my parents' bed every night. And we'd have to kneel at the bed. And we'd have to pray together as a family. And we'd have to repent for our sins. My, my, my parents were making sure we were quadrangle. I think that's a word. I don't know. I just made it up. English, Spanish, Holy Ghost tongues, and prayer. They weren't teaching us how to call our prayer partner. They were teaching us how to pray. But it started in our home. I got memories of my dad sitting outside my bedroom. Oh, God, save Tony. God, even if you got to take him, take him and save him. I'm like, God, I repent of my sins. Don't take me now. I remember I'd messed up and done, I had done some dumb stuff. And I remember I got benched. For those of you that remember benching. That's when we didn't tell, I'm just I'm sorry. That's where if you did something against the word, we said this place is too holy for you to bring strange fire. So you're going to sit. And I was sitting. And I remember my dad got up and preached about a, about a woman named Rispa. And my dad took his jacket off. And he said, Rispa protected hers. 
she fought off the foul of the air. She said, you're not touching what belongs to me. And I can still, my dad passed away seven years ago, but I can still see it and I can hear him. He said, with everything in me, I'm going to protect Tony. I'm going to protect Andrew from rebellion, from sin, from perversion. I'm going to protect it. They're going to know the Holy Ghost. They're going to love the truth. They're going to love Pentecostal fire. They're going to preach the gospel. I don't know, I don't know how it works after you pass on. But dad, if you can see me right now, I want you to know I'm still defending your grandchildren. And I'm defending your heritage. I'm defending your legacy. I'm not going to let the fowls of the air touch our family and take from us what's so precious. You gotta fight for it. You gotta fight for your marriage. I know everything's not perfect. I know things are stressful. But you made a covenant. You didn't eeny, meeny, miny, Matthew. Any money, hey. No, no, no. You entered a covenant. It wasn't just man and woman, it was man, woman, and God. It's a threefold covenant that can't be broken. You better rebuke every devil that's been rising up against you. These are crazy times. Crazy times. Everybody's going crazy, but you got to declare your eyes for me in my house. We're going to serve the Lord. You need to declare. I'm telling you, can I be real? I know you can't do it in the middle of an argument, but when that argument is done, you need to go to the bathroom, lock yourself in the bathroom, and if you got to whisper it, whisper it. But you need to say, my spouse is a blessing. My spouse is a blessing. My spouse is a blessing. My spouse. You need to say it until it like does something on the inside of you. And if you think that's crazy, let me remind you when you were sitting in those Kenneth Hagin Word of Faith conferences about two decades ago, believing in the power of the spoken word, and you believed it when it was money cometh, money cometh, airplanes come. Well, now you need to say romance comes, love comes, unity comes. I'm going to stay married. I'm going to love my wife. I'm going to love my house. My house is going to serve the You got to speak it. Our kids are fighting some devils. There's nothing new under the sun. But there are some mutations of demonic spirits that I don't think we had to fight in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. The way they're having to fight them now. I didn't have to go, I didn't have to go deal with, with teachers trying to force LGBTQ agendas. I didn't have to deal with some of the stuff my kids are having to deal with. So for as frustrated as they might make you every now and then. Do not give them over by the mercies of God. Listen, I got four teenagers. So I'm not telling you I perfected it. I'm living it. But do not give them over to the trap of social media. Do not give them over to YouTube and Snapchat and just think that they're going to be okay laying in their bed five hours a day watching videos of other people living in an alternate universe that's not real and then think they're going to turn it off and get them back in the house of God. It's not, listen, can I tell you something else? It's not time to have less church. It's time to have more church. And get your family in the church. Trying to save my house because Jesus is coming again. Wherever you stand on the theological argument of when, that's fine. But I think we all agree he's coming again. I got some loved ones up there. My father's there. My first wife is there. My current wife's first husband is there. Got some grandparents there. And I don't want to get to heaven, Pastor. 
and see my dad run up and say, Tony, where's my grandkids? Let me say, I was too busy preaching and wherever. I saved everybody, but I didn't save my house, Dad. I don't want my first wife to walk up and say, Tony, the last thing I told you was to raise those kids for God. Where are they? I'm sorry. Or worse, I don't want my kids to get up there and my dad say, hey guys, where's Tony? And they say, he gave up. I remember sitting in a camp meeting with Brother Tenny preaching. You talk about apostolic authority. He preached about the works of the ministry and reminded us that our works would be tried by fire. And he said, how would you feel if you got to heaven and your life's work when it passed through the fire was consumed as stubble? Because it was just your work, not his. I'm under such conviction about making sure my house is right. My kids are right. But it starts with me. I gotta make sure I'm right. I gotta make sure there's no spirits clinging on to me that I'm bringing home with me from the revival. I gotta make sure that I'm not so busy fighting these devils over here that the devil of loneliness and depression and division and divorce and rebellion aren't creeping through the back door. But I'm so, the next conference, that I'll leave my house unguarded. Fight. For your marriage. Pray for your marriage like you pray for Holy Ghost revival. Pray for your kids like you pray for money. The older I get, like any kid, I'm third generation. The older I get, Pastor, I hope this was okay today. The older I get, when I was a kid, I used to be enamored by the mega churches. He's running how many? Wow. Look, they got this, they got that, they got. The older I get, the more impressed I am by the man or woman who might have 20, 30, or 40, but they've been faithful. Because it would have been easy to quit, it would have been easy to give up. But you said, I'm going to be faithful. Hubiera sido fácil tirar la toalla y decir, ya basta. ¿Para qué voy a seguir? No tengo el crecimiento de otra iglesia, pero usted continúa en la fe. Y dijo, voy a mostrar a mi familia un testimonio de qué es ser fiel a la obra de Dios. I'm impressed by faithfulness. And the older I'm getting, the more I'm praying, saying, God, if nothing else is said, let my kids say, we lived through a lot of junk. But God was faithful. Dad was faithful to us and to God. Because we don't need another, we don't need another generation offended at the church about those kids of mine five years ago this week when we had to say goodbye we had a word leukemia was going to bow its knees at the name of Jesus and the night I had to bring my kids in to say goodbye people had snuck into the ICU of MD Anderson with guitars to sing in the room and Jessica could no longer speak she could just give us hand signals and they were in there singing and I said do you want them to sing and she shot her hand up so you sure you want them to sing 
I want to make sure. Do you want them to sing? And she shook her. I think it was our last argument, really, because she's like, I'm kind of going through something. I've said yes three times. Her last act on this earth was to give God her final praise. Her children's final testimony of their mother is that when death visited our home, we didn't lose our praise. So when you ask by what authority do I tell you to protect your home above all costs, it's by the authority of my family's testimony that even death didn't take our praise. My kid stood at her deathbed. My 10-year-old, he said, Mommy, I love you, and I really want you to come home. Some of you, I, I saw a line of people there that I, I know from other churches. You've heard me talk, tell the story before. He said, I really want you to come home, but I don't want you to have cancer. And Daddy says there's no cancer in heaven. So if you have to go to heaven, Mom, that's okay. We just want you to be healed. He said, but I'm going to serve God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make you proud, Mom. I'm going to obey my dad. I wish I would have stopped the speech and taken a video right there. So, baby, could you say it again what, just for the camera? Could you sign this affidavit right now? Just legal document, just real quick. He said, I, I, he said Mommy, I know you wanted to see me get baptized and I." 10 years old, talking like he's 42. I know I, I know I never did it, but if dad gives me permission, I'll be baptized at your funeral. And he went and he got his sister and his brother. He said, mom wanted to see us get baptized. I'm getting baptized at the funeral. You need to get baptized. And you need to get baptized. And you really need the Holy Ghost. I had no intention in talking about this part of the story. Otherwise, I'd have brought the pictures to show you. But at her funeral, all three of those children were water baptized. And my youngest came out of the water, six years old, not speaking English, not speaking Spanish. But at his mother's funeral, he came out of the water speaking in other tongues as the Holy Ghost baptized him. You know who came to our funeral? The comforter. The comforter. The dove. The spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead came to our funeral and I had a vision I saw pastor I saw the spirit of leukemia walk up to the baptistry and have to bow its knee because our worst day turned into our best day because salvation came to our home I buried her in the ground I buried them in baptism this symbolized death this symbolized life. This symbolized sickness. This symbolized healing. This symbolized depression. This symbolized joy. And as a united family, we could stare leukemia in the face and say, Death, where is thy sting? Grave, where is thy victory? God blessed my home. I was walking through a valley I never thought I'd have to walk. I'm mom and dad and preacher. And I'm learning how to be mom and dad. And I don't really know how to be the mother hen yet. And, you know, because the mother hen always is looking for the chicks. And I didn't know to always have to. And I got invited to preach a healing crusade in Orlando. About 35 days after, uh, after Jessica passed away. They said, bring the kids. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's healthy. Let's bring them to a healing crusade. And I was praying for the sick, got lost in the spirit. And I'm over here, and I'm, you know, fire and power. And, I mean, I'm just over here. And I'm like, oh, Lord, where are the chicks? Lost the babies. And when I found them, the three of them were on the steps over here. They were laying hands on the sick. I never, I never taught him to do that. I never, because I want the call of God. This is a word for someone in this room. Let the call of God over your children be genuine. Not coerced, not manipulated, not fabricated, not don't. It, if it's, if, 
if God's going to use them, let God do it. God was, they were laying hands. And when we got back in the car, I said, how did you do that? How did you have the strength? And my son looked me in the eye and he said, Daddy, I don't want anybody to ever feel what we felt. So you don't pray for the sick alone anymore. I'm going to pray for the sick with you. <laughs> Cancer should have left my family alone. Because now I, there was four of us that were praying for the sick. Which means four times the healing. Four times the miracle. Four times the anointing. I'm prophesying over some. Maybe your battle isn't leukemia, but whatever your battle has been, when you come out of this battle, you're coming out with two, three, four, five times the blessing that you had when you went in. You know, I'm, all, I'm almost done, so remain standing if, if you can. Remember, I told you what Pentecostals do when, we, when we're in need. I went to camp meeting again. I went to Dominion camp meeting in Columbus, Ohio. I was just, as I was an attendee. And Pastor Parson got a hold of me. And he said, God told me to tell you, he's about to increase you sevenfold. And seven this, and seven that. And I might not be real smart with math, but there was four of us. And I knew I wasn't having any more babies in the name of Jesus. So I'm trying to figure how we get to seven. Another man got up in that conference and prophesied. He said, the Lord says, this year, I'm going to make you happy again. This year, I'm sending you a wife. Now, hey, that's bold. That's bold. That's kind of crazy. Like you need, to, you need to hear from God and maybe a few angels. I don't know. That's bold. But that year, two years later, after my wife passed away, I met Gina. Gina had buried her first husband from cancer 10 years prior. They were great pastors in Michigan, Corey and Gina McCool. And I go on a date with Gina and I don't really know how to date, and I'm too churchy, and there was no social media when I got married the first time, like, based on those boots and that jacket you're wearing, like, I had to rent this for this conference, but I can see it's normal for you, right? <laughs> wearing that, whatever, whatever, I mean, look, you don't wear this unless you know, you're modern, you're cool. I didn't know who was boo and who was bae. Like, I start dating, and I don't know who is the boo and who is the bae. I don't know. And I go on this date with Gina, and she shows up all, all cute and beautiful, and she walks in. She's a southern belle from East Tennessee, and she walks in, and well, hi. And I said, well, praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> I wish I was exaggerating. I looked at her, I said, well, glory to God. Hallelujah. Got a little huckabuck in there. She said, will you pray over the food? I'm like, sure. I'm like, may I have your hand? She's like, sure. And I t Father, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I take authority over every carb and every calorie. I declare this bacon will bless us and the cholesterol will not prosper. The steak is blessed. It's a miracle I'm married. I'm telling you right now. If Gina was here, she'd say, I know that's right. I mean, it's a miracle. But she started telling me her story. And she said, I was married to a man named Corey McCool. And she said, 10 years ago, Corey was diagnosed with colon cancer. She said, Mylan was five and Macy was one. She said, and within six months, he passed away. We had the same story. She said, but can I tell you about his last day? I said, of course. She said, on his last day. She said, he was looking off into the distance, and I wish I could know what he saw. She said, but he lifted his hand, and he started pumping his fist. He said, I am redeemed.
I am redeemed. And he looked, he looked at his parents and he looked at Gina in his final words as he died with a smile. He said, we win. We win. Her testimony is that when death visited their home, they didn't lose their victory. God brought Gina and I together. And if you'll believe it or not, it was at the wedding that it finally hit me. I'm like, preacher, hold up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven people that had lived through the same hell. Seven people that had lived through the valley of the shadow of death. Seven broken pieces. But God made it one whole, healed, happy, healthy family. Because God cares about your family. He cares about your kids. And now our collective testimony is that when death visited our home, we didn't lose our praise and we didn't lose our victory. And when the pandemic came last year, you know what Gene and I did? We rolled up our sleeves and we said we've been down this way before when we didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring. But the God of 2010, the God of 2016 is the God of 2020, 2021. And 20, he'll make a way. And the greatest gift I can give my heavenly father and Jessica Suarez and Corey McCool is to get to heaven. And Jean and I say, look. We protected our house. The winds came. The fights came. Tears came. Depression came. Anxiety came. But we fought it off. And we made sure to give you a revival in our home. feel like someone needs forgive us for when we didn't understand depression and anxiety forgive us, forgive us when we didn't understand imbalances forgive us for not understanding those things and you're and thinking we just snap it and come off of you but hear me we need counseling while we still cast out devils it's not either or it's both and you know what I did in my house? I took on the spirit of depression and suicide. I said, you're not going to come in my house. You're not going to touch my children. And I made sure they went to counseling so that someone could talk them through. Because I don't know how to counsel, but I know how to do spiritual warfare. And I got out there like Rahab. And I said, I'm not going to let the spirit of suicide touch my children. I'm not going to let the spirit of depression touch. You counsel them. You talk them through. You color whatever you got to color with them, but I'm going to fight off the devils of hell and make sure my family is protected. So forgive me if it's redundant, but fight for your marriage. Fight for your children. Remove the D word from your vocabulary. Because your children deserve a mom and a dad. You say, well, you don't know how bad it is. Well, you don't know what it's like to lose one. We weren't perfect, we had our stuff. But you know what I found out when I lost everything? I kind of missed it. Don't let stupid arguments take away your harvest. You say, well, 
he or she's not worth it. But your kids are. If you won't do it for you and her, or you and him, then do it for the kids. Because it's not their fault. Fight for them. Do it for them. Pray. The same way, you, the, the same way you've been praying for this nation, pray for your marriage. Oh, God, restore America. We'll say, oh, God, restore my marriage. Restore the romance. Restore the love. Restore the patience. Restore the unity. Restore the joking and the loving and the playfulness and the date nights and the movie nights. And restore my love. Two of those five kids are on their way to college in the next two years. I got two more years under my roof to make sure I can control the cell phone. Control where they go. Know where they go. Have every app possible so even when I'm preaching, I'll be like, give the Lord another shot of praise. Why aren't you home yet? Because I don't live with you but I got to take this one to heaven. I got two more years to influence them as much as I possibly can to make sure that they are raised in a home like I was raised where they hear a praying father and a praying mother, not a cussing father and a cussing mother. Not where they see me do one thing on the platform and another thing when I'm in my house. There is a revival of holiness in the body of Christ. It's, it's not coming. It's already taking place. It's not legalism. It's godly holiness. He's purifying the church so that your kids have a chance of knowing the true church. With all the talk you hear about Gen Z and X and all the Y, whatever they all are now, you know what they say about the last one? I don't know what to really think of all the polls because you can make a poll say whatever you want it to say. But you know what some of the polls are saying now? That Gen Z, you know what they're looking for in a church? A church. Not a show, not a concert, a church. They don't care how big it is. They don't care how, they just want community. They want, they, it said, the, one, the poll I read said that what, Gen Z says that when they go to church, they want to feel like they've gone to church. Well, I got good news. That's how we were raised. Why don't we go back to doing what we know works? Why don't we go back to doing what got us to where we are? Why don't we give our children the opportunity to know the same Holy Ghost, the same fire, the same promise, the same holiness, the same integrity that got us to where we are? Now I know I've gone over my time. God is in this house. Forgive me for going so long. I'm normally not a long-winded preacher, except on Sundays. But I'm normally not a long-winded preacher. God has promised me he's going to heal cancer in this room today. He's going to heal people in this room. But I feel arrested in my spirit that before I pray for your body to be healed, corporately, we need to pray for our marriages and pray for our families. And I want to say again, I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching to me and you. Gene and I have been married three years now in December. We got invited last year to do a marriage seminar. And I said, yes, because I'm an evangelist. You don't say no. I said, yeah, sure, we'll come. And I came home and Gina said, um, you know, the calendar says that we're preaching a marriage seminar. I said, yeah. She said, oh, no, we're not. She said, we can attend one. But we're not ready to preach one. Because like that old song that Brother Hemphill wrote many years ago, he's still working on me. So I'm not, I'm not coming from a place of perfection. I'm coming from a place of work. 
I'm convicted. I got to save those kids. I got to save my marriage. I got to make sure I don't know what they hear. My son came off of the bus. The youngest came off of the bus and he's dancing and I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't really, I know how to huck a buck. I don't really know how to dance, but he come off the bus. Can you whip? Ah, and can you nay nay? I'm like, what in the world? He's like, can you whip, whip, and can you nay nay? I'm like, no, but I can pray, pray, and I rebuke that in Jesus' name. I said, where did you learn that? He said, on the bus. I said, on the bus? Man, when I went to school, you'd sit on the bus and shut up. I'm sorry, bad word. It's the South. You had to hush. Those buses are like parties now. They got radios blaring and and the kid. I mean, it's just like, and I can't control what they hear on the bus, but I can control what they hear in my car. I can control what they hear in my house, and I'm making sure that in my house they hear Holy Ghost music. They hear the gospel. They see the gospel. I'm making sure they know the word. And I want to pray. I, I, I feel to pray for healing today. But before we do that, I feel like we need to pray for marriages and for families. And I said that story about me not doing the marriage seminar because I feel like an elder ought to pray for marriages and families. So, Pastor, whether it be you or whether you want to send someone else up here, but I want to pass this mic off to someone for a moment. And I just want to ask that elder, that apostle, whoever, if it's you or someone else, to just pray over these pastoral and ministry families that God would protect us and bless us. Whoever, whoever it is that you're sending here to pray. Let's pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. If you are with your wife, take your, the hand of your wife or your husband. If your kids are here, get close to your kids. Come on, do it. Do it right now. If your children are here, just go with your children right now. Go, 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 go. And I want you to start praying like never before in your life. Come on, Father, in the name of Jesus, now we pray. And we get in agreement as a family. We understand now by this prophetic word that our families as are the most important thing that we have in this world and the first thing that we say Lord is forgive us Father in the name of Jesus forgive us to make other things prior our priority in our lives Father we repent in the name of Jesus as leaders and pastors now in this moment in the name of Jesus Father forgive us Come on, guys. Forgive us, Father. If you're a preacher, if you've been so busy in church, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for making other people, other projects, the church, the organization, facilities, a, a preaching appointments, all of that priorities, Lord, while the, the devil is touching our kids. But we repent now in the name of Jesus and we cry out to you, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us, Father. But now we make the commitment that from now on we are changing our priorities in the name of Jesus. And we declare that the devil is not going to touch our families, that the devil is not going to touch our kids' minds. And now in the name of Jesus, we release healing in our families. Now in the name of Jesus. If you are a father, if you have your children, just pray for them now in the name of Jesus. Come on, come on. Father, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord. If our children are seeing us being a spiritual praying in tongues filled with the Holy Spirit only in the church forgive us Lord we make the holy commitment right now to start moving our pulpits to our house our prayer times to our house our worship times to our house in the name of Jesus Father we take the veil of religion out of our faces now and in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus, we break generational curses. Come on. Now in the name of Jesus, if you have your children, just lay your hands in your children. Come on. Lay your hands in your children. Come on, mom and dad. Come on, mom and dad. Do it. Do it now. 
and say in the name of Jesus, I declare that every curse and every bad stuff that I somehow, by being distracted aloud in my family, in my wife, in my kids, I cancel it in the name of Jesus. And I declare that it's ineffective now in the name of Jesus. Come on, come on, come on. Father, and now... Under this word that it was released today, we declare blessing. Come on, fathers. Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless my children. And I bless my grandchildren. And I bless my generations. I bless them in the name of Jesus. And I declare that the anointing, the holiness, the fruit of the Spirit, the Pentecostal fire is going to increase in every generation. And every generation is going to be better and better and better in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. O tamashe ke mosi manare ke yanda moshaya. O yamanda sele mahasho kora mande si alamaya. O ramashaya ramosaya rabashe kaya. Oh, ya samate le ma kosha mande si kataya monda. Koya mande shira mande si kora bataya shara baha. It's a begotten blessing from one generation to the next. Grandfather to father, father to son, to grandchildren, great grandchildren, great great grandchildren. That labor isn't in vain, that ministry hasn't been in vain. Faithfulness to God, consecrated living hasn't been in vain. There's a begotten blessing in it. There's some Abrahams in here that are about to begotten, have some begotten Isaacs, and Isaacs are going to have some begotten Jacobs. And oh, hallelujah! Hallelujah! I pray the blessing of the Lord over your house. I pray that every demonic evil attack that has risen up against your marriage, risen up against your ministry or your family, be arrested right now by the Holy Ghost. While we're in this conference, go ministering spirits and bind them bind those evil spirits go to in, go into our homes and push them out push them back to the pit from whence they came bring healing cleansing and purity to our homes and may us go home to miracles let a pastor go home to a prodigal on the porch waiting let another minister here get their family back as his Christmas present this year. Let the family come home. Let reconciliation come to that family has been squabbling over silly stuff. But this year, healing comes. And Father, as for me and my house, I make a commitment to you today, covenant with you. I'm not going to preach something I don't live. I'm not going to preach something to churches and not preach it in my home. I'm not going to tell people to do things that I don't do in my own home. God, I'm going to, I'm going to turn and I'm going to start doing a better job of preaching in my house and prophesying to my house and laying hands on my house because the stronger my house is the more I believe you'll be pleased with me. 
Now, if you need healing in your body, I know we have to go. Please forgive me for being so long-winded tonight. But if you need healing in your body, at the count of three, if you're okay with an altar call, I feel Jehovah Rapha here. At the count of three, if you need healing in your body, if you'd come to this altar, I believe God's going to heal you. One, two, three. My brother, raise your hands. Raise both hands. Because the thing that God's about to do for you, says the Spirit of the Lord, is not just for you, but it's for your bloodline. The curse breaks today. And the blessing begins today. When I lay hands on you, it's like I'm laying hands on your children and on your grandchildren and even those that are afar off. And I declare over you that as I lay my hand on your hand, on your head, the Father is placing his hand of blessing over your family. You, sir, are going home to a miracle in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now these have come for healing if you're here tonight and you say brother Tony I need a fresh touch from God I, I was at a little revival in Elizabethan Tennessee and my wife Gina's grandmother the evangelist said if you need anything from God come now and Gina's 88 year old grandmother came down the center aisle on a walker and I started wondering what does Mother Carver need from God this lady's had the Holy Ghost for over 65 years she probably speaks in three different languages of tongues what could she need from God and when she got up there the evangelist said mother what do you need of God and she said oh I just need a fresh touch and I, my heart was pricked if that saint that has had the Holy Ghost for over 65 years. If she needs a fresh touch from God, I need a fresh touch from God. So I believe that there is a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit in this room for you today. If you're still dealing with the aftermath, the residue of COVID in your body, I break it off of you right now in Jesus' name. May it come out of your lungs. May you regain your senses. Fatigue comes off of you now in the name of Jesus. Strength from on high comes on you. Blessing from on high comes upon you. The ability to breathe without a nebulizer or an inhaler is being restored to you. Touch right now by the power of God. You're supposed to wear a crown of righteousness, but you're really wearing a crown of migraines. If that's you, raise your hand. It comes off of you now, woman, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Is that your wife? Lay your hand on your wife. Lord, as he lays his hand on her head, I declare she's crowned with healing. She's crowned with healing right now. Touch. Be healed by the power of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I prayed over migraines, but I still feel it. I still feel like there's someone else, something. I'm not a doctor, but something else with your head, your skull. If you need healing, and maybe it's not migraines, but you need healing in your head, something with your head, if that's you, in the name of Jesus. All right, there it is, in Jesus' name. I saw hands go up, one, two, three, four. Healing come, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Jesus name in Jesus name unhealed whiplash chiropractor can't take care of it doctor hasn't been you've rubbed every essential oil that there is and you still got from the whiplash if that's you wave your hand at me God would heal you today is that you is that you for the whiplash is there someone else all right 
keep those hands up. If you see someone with their hand up for the whiplash, just stretch your hand toward them. In Jesus' name, three, two, one. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Be healed. Because you're so close, I'll just go ahead and do the operation here. What a doctor can't do, what a chiropractor can't do, one touch of the Holy Ghost does it right now in Jesus' name. Be healed by the power of God. That person that's in this room that's dealing with a doctor and we're going, it, 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 we're trying to pinpoint whatever it is kidney, gallbladder, something else, kidney, gallbladder. I mean, we're just we're just trying to wrestle. It's almost like they're doing like a Where's Waldo with your body and you're tired of it. Wave your hand at me right now. Well, that worked out. Step forward, brother, if you will. You, 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 you. Is there someone else? And you. I know you. God bless you, Pastor. This man messed me up. I preached for him in January. He asked me a question at the dinner table nobody's ever asked me before, and it messed me up. He said, how does a church have revival? And I'm supposed to be a revivalist, and I didn't know how to answer the question. I left embarrassed. I went home, and we rebranded the ministry. It's no longer the center ministries. We call the ministry Revival Makers because I started on a journey with God. God, what does it take? So now when I come back, I'll have an answer. You should know this man. His daddy's kind of famous in this town. Pastors in Las Vegas. It's no longer the city of sin. It's the city of Jesus. Lord, he wants revival. He's asked for revival. He has sought revival. He's seeking it. He's praying for it. He's believing for it. But you told us tonight that in this season, we don't even have to ask for it. We're just going to step into it and receive. And I deem that my brother has been faithful. My brother has sought you. My brother has a right heart. So I declare revival now over you, over your ministry. And as the Lord heals your body, it's the sign of how God's healing your church in the name of Jesus. Fire upon you right now, brother. Woo. It's my opinion. It's my opinion. What I, my opinion, I didn't say theology, my opinion that when the doctor can't pinpoint exactly what's wrong, it's a spirit of infirmity. That's my opinion. So I take authority over the spirit of infirmity that's been affecting you and afflicting you. Stopping you and prohibiting you from being able to run at 100% like you used to and the way you want to. But I command that spirit, you come out of my brother tonight in the name of Jesus. For there are many, many, many more years on the inside of him. Years of productivity. Years of harvest. Years of abundance. The Lord says, do not let your hand fall for you. You're not done yet. I'm not done with you, says the Lord. You're about to catch your second wind. And the Lord says, I'm going to send men and women. They're going to raise your hands in your weak moments. And you're healed, the Lord says, starting right now. Now, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I'm sorry. I know, I know we've been here too long. I apologize. If you need healing, raise your hands. I'm going to pray a corporate prayer. And when I shout now, finally come in with that song you've been wanting to sing that I held you off from. I'm so sorry. Father, if this be thy word, confirm it with the demonstration of your power over the next several minutes in this house. By the authority of the word of God and by the power that's in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, I take authority over sin, sickness, disease, and demonic spirits. And by the authority 
of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command you to be healed, be delivered, be restored, and be made whole now in Jesus' name. Give God a shout of praise as healing flows, as healing flows. I pray over your sons and daughters. I pray over my sons and daughters. They shall serve the Lord. They'll graduate high school. They'll graduate college. They'll prophesy. They'll rebuke devils. They'll speak in other tongues. They'll have revival. They will serve the Lord. Touch. If you need healing in your heart somewhere right around here, would you raise your hand? Oh, pastor, mercy. For 22 years, when I hear the sound of a clock, tick, tock, tick, tock, it's been a sign that God's going to heal hearts. I bless this man of God. And I speak healing to his heart in Jesus' name. May it tick tock like a clock and never miss a beat. Father, I thank you that you strengthen his heart. That you heal his heart. And I pray times are refreshing over the apostle. Blessing over the apostle. And healing comes now in Jesus' name. Somebody give God praise. only about the third time I've ever done this and I've, I've, it's only been this year that I've felt it but if and again some things are private some things I understand if you can't make it public but if there's some, is there somebody here that's in need of a transplant is there someone here would you wave your hand at me if you're in need of a transplant and maybe it's private you don't need it but is there somebody if you are wave at me I don't want to miss you if you are missing somebody if you're at home is this is this being broadcast if you're at home put it in the comment section father if that person's watching if that person's in this room or if that person is to find out later I thank you that while they get on a list on the earth they have priority in heaven and I thank you Lord that you send your blessing you send the part and you do the recovery work like that and what should take months will happen in a matter of days and weeks 
in Jesus' name of Nazareth. Father, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, as that young lady has laid hands on this lady's knees, it's as, it's as if Jesus Christ himself is laying his hands on her knees. I command ligaments and bones and organs and tissues in her entire body to be strengthened because while we're focusing on the knees, I feel like some other things from head to toe might as well get touched at the same time. Father, I thank you. That you heal her and you strengthen her now. Whew. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Kidneys, raise your hand. You again. You might as well get the whole, the whole enchilada. Someone else. You. Hey, brother. Uh, stand on that side. Right there, yeah. Right there. Push forward just a little bit. Right there. I'll get I'll get right over there. When I was a kid, we sang a song in Sunday school, head and shoulders, knees and toes, eyes and ears and nose and something else. Head and I think that's your song right now. And I think the master is gonna give you a complete overhaul in this season. I think tears of sorrow are turning into tears of joy. Because your family needs you, your church needs you, this country needs you. So I speak life into you, woman, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Healing virtue into you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. From the crown of your head to the soles of your feet, when I lay my hands on your head, everything gets healed. And when they check you the next time, they'll ask you, what happened? And you're going to tell them, Jesus. God, oh, forgive me, brother. Two right there. Come on, brother. Scoot over a little bit for, yeah. Raise both hands. Can you lay your hands right back here on both sides? Father, I thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to, Brother Buster, my mentor taught me, you don't say, thus saith the Lord. If you're not sure, thus saith the Lord. If you're not sure, it's, thus saith the Lord, you say, I feel, I sense, I think. I think you might have been the person I was talking about, about a transplant. Because I was about to pray for healing, and I felt stopped from the Holy Ghost. I don't feel to pray for healing in your kidneys. I feel to pray that God would give you new kidneys. Now, there's an old evangelist I used to know when I was a kid. His name's Freddie Clark. If Brother Freddie was here, he'd say, go ministering spirits. Go to the parts department of heaven and fetch my brother two new kidneys. And then Brother Freddie would wait around and he'd go like this and he'd go like this and he'd say, one moment. Mission accomplished, parts received, now it's time for installation. Receive two new kidneys in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Be completely healed by the power of God. May your health, may your, woo, 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 ha, ha, tabashe. May your health be restored to you. And I heard God say not just his health, but his wealth and his joy. You're going to be a laughing, happy in Jesus' name. Heal, deliver, restore right now. And you too. <laughs> oh! Stand.
Stand them back up. Stand them back up. Lord, you just healed his body. Now you're going to heal his heart. And when I lay my hands on his head, you're getting your passion back. You're getting your fire back. You're getting your tenacity back. You're getting your zeal back. You're getting your joy back. You're getting your laughter back. You're getting your peace back. You're getting your house back. You're getting your business back. You're getting other stuff back. And you're getting your ability to dream back. Three, two, one, now. Africa, a country, a, a continent, anybody that represents Africa here? Do you have some kind of connection with Africa? Are you here? I saw Asia. Is it you, brother? Someone here that has a connection to Africa? Is there anyone here? Who is it? You, brother? I just felt to pray for Africa right now. I don't even know what I'm praying for Africa. But I felt to pray for Africa right now. Lord, I bless the continent. I bless the nations. I bless the work of that man and his family. Whatever it is he does for Africa. Whatever, whatever it is he was doing or is going to do. We call it blessed. We call it favored. We, Lord, I see a pile of papers. I see a pile of papers, and I see some paperwork lost somewhere in the middle or at the bottom. But I see the angels of the Lord come and pulling out my brother's paper. I don't know what it's for, but I see paperwork coming out of the middle and being placed on the top. I speak favor. I speak promotion. And I say God does it in Jesus' name. Brother, I'm laying hands on a very strong, strong man. A man that I have a hunch a lot of people fear. But Lord, if there be anything on the inside that needs healing today, let it be healed right now by the laying on of hands. Touch. Ooh, there it is. Pray in the Holy Ghost so I can pray for my brother. Hallelujah. God bless you. In Jesus' name, touch and be healed touch and be healed if you've had a hearing loss oh that's you he said well it's kind of good when you're that close which ear is it brother this is the one that doesn't work let's make sure because we don't want to mess it up and then they'd be like oh got the wrong it's this one this one how long since birth wow raise your hands brother ear start opening up for my brother in the name of Jesus of Nazareth let the ear open up we ask we ask that the volume be turned up in Jesus name and may he start experiencing healing hearing and health in Jesus name in Jesus name how long brother 10, 12 years. I'm going to come right. Don't, don't move, brother. <laughs> Have you ever had any hearing in that ear? Like 30%. Yes, it got worse as I got older. Got worse as you got older. Father, I thank you that it starts getting better as he gets older. In Jesus' name. Progressively better, 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 better. Let there be a popping of the ear. Something just open up and he just say, whoa, wow, that was weird. And it'll get better and better in Jesus' name. Raise your hands, brother. Raise your hands. Which ear is it? Both. Oh, 
in both of them. Did you just take your, you took your hearing aids out? Yeah. Yes, sir. They say that I have vascular disease in the, the blood vessels in my brain. They eventually go to the center, and I don't know if anybody is here. It's because of the stress of that condition. It's what you may have. It's not sealing off the blood vessels. All right. Raise your hands, brother. I'm not a doctor. So I don't know how to pinpoint it all. But earlier, you remember, I felt to pray for someone's head. I said, it's not migraines. It's something else with the head. I choose to believe it was you. May you be crowned with healing power. Ears, open up in Jesus' name. Ear, open up. In Jesus' name, whatever needs to take place for healing to come, let it come right now by the power of God. And when I lay my hand on his head, may the fire of God come and touch him right now. Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. How you feeling, brother? I can't tell any difference. You can't tell any difference yet. Not this one at all? No, Jesus, thank you for touching this ear. Someone said, what do you do? I'm sorry, I feel like doing a little Bible college lesson here right now. What do you do when they don't get healed? Nothing. Because if they got healed, I couldn't take the credit. So if he doesn't do it in the instant, I also don't have to feel the weight of it. Because we're just vessels that God uses. And if we would learn that, we'd get back to praying for the sick again. I can't take credit if God does the work. So I just trust the Lord. I feel no pressure because we're believing the Lord. And I know a miracle is instant. And I know healing is progressive. And I'm asking you, God, progressive healing to these ears. Progressive healing come to my brother. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody give God praise in this house. Lord, I bless these ministers, these pastors, these missionaries, these evangelists, these prophets, and these teachers. I bless the work of their hands. I pray abundance and prosperity. I pray Holy Ghost revival in their churches, their conferences, their camp meetings, their conventions, but first and foremost, in their homes, in their marriages, and with their children, in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you. you.